Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In 1968, Tammy Wynette released her award-winning single, Stand By Your Man. This was Tammy's fourth album, but she was not yet confident in her songwriting abilities. In fact, when she played the song for her boyfriend and soon-to-be husband, country superstar George Jones, he was not impressed. But he was wrong, and the song became an instant classic. But the late 1960s was the beginning of the women's liberation movement, and some people took offense to what they believed was the song's message. With lyrics like, but if you love him, you'll forgive him, even though he's hard to understand. They interpreted as stand by your man no matter what he does, cheating or otherwise. I bring this song up because Mary Jo Buttafuoco, the victim in this episode, stood by her husband Joey for 11 years after being attacked by his teenage lover. Mary Jo ignored the publicity and gossip that surrounded Joey and stood by him despite his salacious affair. And she stood by him even through a shot to the face. But I am certain if Tammy Wynette had met Mary Jo Buttafuoco, she would have told her not to stand by him, but to run away as fast as she could. Bosch Legacy returns in a two-episode premiere event. Maddie's been taken. Oh, God. Nothing can stop a father. Is he alive? From doing what the law can't. Harry, we have to do this the right way. You have to. I don't. Bosch Legacy. Stream the new season October 20th, exclusively on Freebie. I'm going deep into my wife's family history, digging up the cold case of her murdered great-grandmother. And did I mention that I'm looking into whether the murderer was actually the beloved family patriarch? Follow Ghost Story wherever you get your podcasts. Listen everywhere on October 23rd, or you can binge early and ad-free on Wondery Plus the same day. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psych. I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Amy Fisher. On May 19, 1992, 37-year-old Mary Jo Buttafuoco was painting furniture in the backyard of her Massapequa, New York home when the doorbell rang. Her husband, Joey, was at work elsewhere on Long Island and her young children were off in school. So, Mary Jo paused her painting and walked through the beachfront house to answer the front door. Mary Jo did not recognize the petite teenage girl with long brown hair on her doorstep. But when she saw a young man waiting in an old maroon Thunderbird on the street, she guessed that the teenagers had come to speak to her husband about their car. Joey Buttafuoco worked at his family's auto body business. The teenage girl, however, made it clear she wanted to talk to Mrs. Buttafuoco. 
She claimed that Joey was sleeping with her 16-year-old sister. Mary Jo doubted the teenager's story and quizzed her. The teenager said her name was Anne Marie. She was 19 years old and she then had Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In 1968, Tammy Wynette released her award-winning single, Stand By Your Man. This was Tammy's fourth album, but she was not yet confident in her songwriting abilities. In fact, when she played the song for her boyfriend and soon-to-be husband, country superstar George Jones, he was not impressed. But he was wrong, and the song became an instant classic. But the late 1960s was the beginning of the women's liberation movement, and some people took offense to what they believed was the song's message. With lyrics like, but if you love him, you'll forgive him, even though he's hard to understand. They interpreted as stand by your man no matter what he does, cheating or otherwise. I bring this song up because Mary Jo Buttafuoco, the victim in this episode, stood by her husband Joey for 11 years after being attacked by his teenage lover. Mary Jo ignored the publicity and gossip that surrounded Joey and stood by him despite his salacious affair. And she stood by him even through a shot to the face. But I am certain if Tammy Wynette had met Mary Jo Buttafuoco, she would have told her not to stand by him, but to run away as fast as she could. Bosch Legacy returns in a two-episode premiere event. Maddie's been taken. Oh, God. Nothing can stop a father. Is he alive? From doing what the law can't. Harry, we have to do this the right way. You have to. I don't. Bosch Legacy. Stream the new season October 20th, exclusively on Freebie. I'm going deep into my wife's family history, digging up the cold case of her murdered great-grandmother. And did I mention that I'm looking into whether the murderer was actually the beloved family patriarch? Follow Ghost Story wherever you get your podcasts. Listen everywhere on October 23rd, or you can binge early and ad-free on Wondery Plus the same day. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Amy Fisher. On May 19, 1992, 37-year-old Mary Jo Buttafuoco was painting furniture in the backyard of her Massapequa, New York home when the doorbell rang. Her husband, Joey, was at work elsewhere on Long Island and her young children were off in school. So, Mary Jo paused her painting and walked through the beachfront house to answer the front door. Mary Jo did not recognize the petite teenage girl with long brown hair on her doorstep. But when she saw a young man waiting in an old maroon Thunderbird on the street, 
She guessed that the teenagers had come to speak to her husband about their car. Joey Buttafuoco worked at his family's auto body business. The teenage girl, however, made it clear she wanted to talk to Mrs. Buttafuoco. She claimed that Joey was sleeping with her 16-year-old sister. Mary Jo doubted the teenager's story and quizzed her. The teenager said her name was Anne Marie. She was 19 years old, and she then held up a white T-shirt with a complete auto body logo emblazoned on its front as proof of the affair, saying, quote, I was making my sister's bed and found this. Still doubtful, Mary Jo asked why the 16-year-old sister didn't make her own bed. The teenager grew frustrated with Mary Jo's dismissiveness. She demanded to know why Mary Jo wasn't disgusted that her, quote, 40-year-old husband was sleeping with a 16-year-old girl. Mary Jo tired of the conversation and ended it by saying that she would let Joey, quote, who was not yet 40, know that Anne Marie had stopped by. As she turned to reach for the screen door, there was a sudden explosion and blow to the right side of her face. Mary Jo slumped to the ground and then everything went black. After shooting Mary Jo, the teenager fled in the waiting Thunderbird. Neighbors who heard the gunshot ran to help Mary Jo. She was unconscious and losing a lot of blood. The bullet had entered below her right ear at her neck. As paramedics arrived, another neighbor called her husband at the auto body shop and told him to get home fast. Joey arrived just as a helicopter was airlifting Mary Jo from the nearby beach to the trauma center. Stunned, Joey sat on his front step staring down at the large pool of blood on the doorstep while police asked him questions. He said he had no idea who shot his wife. Detectives gathered three bullets and one spent casing. Whoever the shooter was, they surmised, that person did not know how to handle a gun. During the eight-hour surgery to save Mary Jo's life, doctors repaired her torn carotid artery, but had to leave a 25 caliber bullet lodged in the base of her brain above the spinal column. Removing it posed a greater risk of complete paralysis. When Mary Jo woke up two days later, the right side of her face was indeed paralyzed, and she was left permanently deaf in her right ear, and her vision was impaired. She could not swallow or speak. Her jaw was dislocated. The bullet had also grazed her esophagus. With detectives and Joey standing at her bedside, Mary Jo wrote down the few details she could recall on a yellow legal pad. None of the information made sense until Mary Jo wrote that the teenager had a white auto body t-shirt. Joey immediately told police that he knew who the shooter was, 17-year-old Amy Fisher. Amy Fisher was the daughter of a client, Elliot Fisher. Amy had brought in her car multiple times over the past year after several scrapes. Joey told police that Amy was infatuated with him and that, so far, she was the only person he had given a white, complete auto body shirt. But Joey left out some really important details to the police. The first, and I think the most important, Let's see, what would that be, what would that be? Oh, I remember now. He was having an affair with the teenager who had just tried to murder his wife. (laughs) 
Amy was born on August 24th, 1974. She was the only child of Elliot and Roseanne Fisher. Elliot was a two-time divorcee and 19 years older than Roseanne. The couple met when Roseanne joined his successful furniture upholstery business, and they married over her family's objections. While Amy felt close to her mother, she often talked about being afraid of her father. And she claimed, although it was never verified, that he was physically as well as verbally abusive. Both Elliot and Roseanne worked really long hours, six days a week, which meant Amy was often home alone. When she was 12, her parents remodeled one of the family's bathrooms. During this time, Elliot called home and instructed Amy to let the tile contractor in to work. She claimed while he was there, the man who was an acquaintance of Elliot's raped her. Her parents did not learn about it for years. Elliot and Roseanne indulged Amy. They bought her pets and even her own car. According to available information on her childhood from official records, interviews with her parents, relatives, friends, and her attorney, the one overriding theme of Amy's childhood and adolescence is that her parents indulged her. Perhaps I should say overindulged her every wish, and then some. When she repeatedly banged up the nice car her father had gifted her before she had even had her official driver's license, rather than let her live without a car, he bought her an even more expensive one. Sloby Wolf, a noted teacher, author, and parenting lecturer, says that demanding argumentative children who resent being told no, ignore, their parents and teachers. There's a cluster of behavior she describes that compromise a syndrome, spoiled child syndrome. Quote, these are kids that are self-centered, excessive, narcissistic, immature, show a lack of consideration for others, recurrent temper tantrums, and are unable to handle delayed gratification. Another child behavioral expert, pediatrician Bruce McIntosh, attributes spoiled child syndrome to, quote, the failure of parents to enforce consistent, age-appropriate limits. Hmm, sound like anyone we've been talking about? According to one close relative of Amy's, quote, they were trying to buy her love. They let her run free until she got into trouble in her mid-teens. But by then, it was too late. She was her own person. She began the affair with Buttafuoco when she was still 16. Her father found out about it when she was 17 and was diagnosed with an STD. He called the local district attorney to press charges on her lover, but backed down because... He was afraid if he persisted, he'd, quote, lose my daughter forever. Looks to me like Amy was lost to him long before that. In addition to her problems at home, Amy also struggled to fit in at school. At one point, she got into a fight with a bigger girl who broke Amy's jaw and nose. Classmates said that Amy would do anything for attention. Amy met Joey Buttafuoco in November of 1990 when she and her father took her car in for repairs. Amy would later say that in contrast to her father, Joey was very kind to her. On July 2nd, 1991, Amy brought her car to the shop to have stereo equipment installed. Joey said that the installation would take a while and offered to give her a ride home. He called Elliot Fisher for his consent. Amy was flattered. 
When they arrived at the Fisher house, Joey asked her for a tour and Amy happily obliged. According to Amy in her 2004 autobiography, If I Knew Then, when they reached Amy's room, Joey threw her down on her bed and kissed her. He told her she was beautiful and that he loved her. And then they had sex. I know what you're thinking, and you are right. They did not have sex. He was 36 years old, and she was 16. That is considered statutory rape. Joey arranged for the two of them to meet up that evening at the Freeport Motel in Massapequa. He checked into their room using his real name and photo ID. He prepaid to use the room for four hours. Over the next few months, Joey routinely took Amy out to dinner at expensive restaurants and afterwards, they had sex at different area hotels on his 16-foot boat named Double Trouble or at an apartment above the family auto body shop. Amy bragged about her older boyfriend to people at school. That Amy believed Joey was her boyfriend most likely had a lot to do with her age and the ignorance that goes along with being 16. But in November of 1991, Amy was hit hard with reality when she insisted that Joey choose between his marriage or her. And I believe we all know how this went. Of course, Joey told her that he was never going to divorce Mary Jo. Joey maintained and repeatedly told her that marriage was, quote, until death do us part. Devastated, Amy broke off their relationship. But in just a few weeks, Joey and Amy were seeing each other again. Surprise, surprise. Around this time, Amy told Joey that she needed money. According to Amy, he suggested that she become an escort and even knew a company that would hire her. Of course he did. Using a fake ID and the name Marie, 17-year-old Amy started working at ABBA Escorts in December of 1991. She used a pager that Joey had given her to set up dates. And soon, she had three regular customers. Whether it was his idea or not, Joey did not object to Amy becoming a sex worker. One of the questions that people often ask about this story is, was this just about Amy Fisher being promiscuous? And if it was, why would she do that? That's not an easy question to answer because the word itself has many connotations. So let's just go with the dictionary definition. Promiscuity is, quote, having many sexual partners not restricted to one class, sort, or person. Indiscriminate. Because the key word in that definition is indiscriminate, as in with no particular feeling or regard with whom a person is having sex. Yes, Amy was promiscuous. Amy became an escort at 17, and in addition to having sex with Joey Buttafuoco, whom she claimed to love, she had many customers, including three regulars. She did not really need the money, at least according to what her parents were reportedly doling out to her. Plus, Items such as the two cars her dad bought her, jewelry, and other very expensive gifts. A friend who heard about her being an escort asked her, you sleep with guys? She replied, it's for the money. And according to her friend, it was a lot of money. Her rates were reportedly $110 an hour. Remember, this is the early 1990s, and that would be around $250 an hour today. She frequently went on spending sprees for clothes in which she would drop four to $500 each time. 
While Joey did not mind Amy being a sex worker, he did, however, tell her to stop dating a 29-year-old gym owner named Paul Makeley. Through it all, Amy remained fixated on Joey. She became convinced that the only way she and Joey could be together was if Mary Jo was dead. Remember, till death do us part. Amy tried to recruit two different young men to help her kill Mary Jo. 21-year-old Stephen Sleeman said Fisher offered him $600 to shoot Mary Jo in October of 91. In a scheme that Sleeman later recounted to police in exchange for immunity, Fisher rang the Buttafuoco doorbell on the pretext of selling candy for a high school fundraiser while he hid behind the shrubs with a rifle. Sleeman maintained that the gun did not have bullets and that he would never kill anyone. After Mary Jo bought the chocolate bar and closed her door, Sleeman said Amy was upset that he did not follow through with their plan. In the spring of 92, Amy met 21-year-old auto parts salesman Peter Gagenti. He offered to help Amy get a gun. On May 19, 1992, Guagenti paged Amy while she was in class at John F. Kennedy High School. Amy went to the school nurse, signed herself out, and met up with Gagenti at her house. She paid him $800 for a titanium 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Gagenti then drove Amy to the Buttafuoco's house in his 1983 maroon Thunderbird and waited while Amy went to the front door. Mary Jo Buttafuoco and Amy Fisher spoke for about 15 minutes before Amy pulled the gun out of her pocket and shot Mary Jo in the head. She and Gagenti fled in his car to the Fisher house only stopping to throw the gun and the white shirt in a sewer. On May 21st, police had Joey Buttafuoco page Amy. When Amy called him back, she refused to meet with him. But the phone call had the intended effect. Police drew Amy out and away from her parents. After hanging up with Joey, Amy told her parents she was going to the beach and drove off in her car. Cops pulled her over just blocks away from her house and brought her into the police station for questioning. Over the next several hours, police questioned then 17-year-old Amy without a lawyer present. The age of consent in New York is now and was then 17 years old. Ergo, Amy was not a minor, so she did not have to have her parents with her when she was questioned. At first, she denied any involvement. Then Amy admitted it was she who shot Mary Jo. But she claimed it was an accident. Amy said she grew frustrated by Mary Jo's attitude and hit her with the gun, which accidentally fired. She also told police that Joey had given her the gun and it was his idea that she shoot Mary Jo. Police arrested Amy, but did not find her accusations against Joey credible. I think I know the reason why. When the police and Joey were at Mary Jo's bedside at the hospital and Mary Jo mentioned the white shirt Joey immediately said, I know who did this. It's this crazy teenager that's infatuated with me. That gave Joey a lot of protection, and that's why they did not believe her accusations against him. The next morning, Nassau County Assistant DA charged Amy with attempted second-degree murder, first-degree assault, and several firearms-related felonies. Her bail was set at $2 million, the highest ever 
in New York's Nassau County history. Meanwhile, Elliot and Roseanne Fisher had no idea where their daughter was. When Amy did not return home the evening of the 21st, the Fishers filed a missing persons report at their local police station. They only learned what had happened the next morning when a homicide detective called the Fisher home to tell them about Amy's arrest. The juicy story of a 17-year-old high school senior shooting the wife of her married older lover guaranteed national headlines. The press had a field day. They dubbed Amy Fisher the Long Island Lolita. A Newsday reporter, Shirley Perlman, noted in an article at the time, quote, kids like Amy Fisher are not supposed to become prostitutes and have love affairs with married men twice their age and face charges of attempted murder. No, they certainly are not. But without taking any of the blame for her future acts, I will say this about her nickname, Lolita. It is based on a character from Russian novelist Vladimir Nabokov's book, Lolita, in which a middle-aged professor becomes obsessed with a 12-year-old girl that he kidnaps and sexually abuses. But for a while, the book and its subsequent film adaptations was viewed as a story about a young female temptress who seduced older men and drove them wild. The moniker Lolita became synonymous with the sexualization of young girls. This is uh, nonsense. In that book, the girl, the child I should say, is 12 years old. That is rape, straight up. It's abuse. According to Amy, she was raped as a child. Some of her later sexual attitudes and activities might be related to that trauma. But calling Amy Fisher a Lolita is not entirely correct. Now, I know some of you will get very angry at me for saying this, but I don't put 16-year-old Amy Fisher in the same category as a 12-year-old. And her later crimes, in my opinion, are not excused by any trauma she may have endured earlier in her life. So where does that leave us? Is there an explanation for this behavior besides Amy was just a sexually promiscuous, spoiled rich kid who would stop at nothing, including murder, to get what she wanted? Where did her drive for sex the domination of another woman's man and her insatiable appetite for spending come from? One possible answer would be the demonic hypothesis. Now that's not to be confused with demonic, which implies evil possession of one's soul or psyche. That is not what I'm talking about. The notion of the demonic can refer to anything, good or bad, that completely takes over one's personality. According to the late psychologist Rollo May, quote, the daemonic is any natural function that has the power to take over the whole person. Sex, anger, rage, and the craving for power are just a few examples. The demonic can be either creative or destructive, but is normally both. So could the demonic hypothesis have applied to Amy Fisher? Could it explain her promiscuity? Applying Dr. May's theory to Amy's hypersexuality, I want to point out here she was not his patient. It could be a manifestation of demonic but he thinks it is much more likely the same thing that primarily motivates any addictive behavior. And that is avoidance of anxiety, anger, grief, or pain. According to Dr. Stephen Diamond, quote, 
Addiction is an extreme example of an existential challenge that we all wrestle with every day, accepting reality as it is. One obvious dynamic of addictive behavior, be it alcohol or illicit drugs, sex, food, internet use, or television, is the powerful connection between addiction and the compulsive desire to alter, avoid, deny, and escape reality. Excessive alcohol and drug use are substance addictions. For purposes of this discussion, the behaviors of excessive sex, overeating, internet gambling, and TV watching are all compulsive behaviors. Excessive spending, such as Amy did on her frequent shopping trips, is also compulsive. For the compulsive spender, the reinforcement is every time the credit card is accepted or the cash is accepted and they take possession of an object. They may not want the object really or certainly don't need it. The spending is its own reward. While Amy remained in the Nassau County Jail, the paparazzi chased Joey everywhere. He continued to deny ever having sex with Amy. I don't know about you, but I remember that, and I considered his denials a real knee slapper. Journalists dug through Joey's past, imagine that, and learned about his 1980s cocaine habit, which had earned him the name Joey Coco Puffs. There were also never proven rumors about his ties to Long Island escort services. Mary Jo, now walking with a cane, continued to stand by the man she had loved since she was 15 years old. At Amy's arraignment on May 29th, she pled not guilty. When Elliot and Roseanne could not raise enough bail money, Amy's lawyer constructed a deal to sell the life rights to Amy's story. KLM Productions paid $60,000 toward her $2 million bail in exchange for the rights. And Amy was released on July 29th. Almost overnight, a book hit the shelves and three made-for-TV movies were put into production. The Buttafucos also sold their life rights to pay for Mary Jo's mounting medical bills. Rather than face an uncertain jury trial, on September 23, 1992, Amy pled guilty to a reduced charge of first-degree assault. Her sentencing was scheduled for November 1992. But Amy never seemed to learn. While she was out on bail, her ex-boyfriend, Paul Makeley, secretly set her up with the help of a tabloid news program. Makeley invited Amy to his private gym, which was outfitted with hidden recording equipment. Then he asked her to name her six wishes before she went to prison. Amy said she and Makeley could get married so that she could have conjugal visits in prison. Worse, she seemed to want her name in the press so that she could capitalize on it. Amy said she deserved a Ferrari for copying a plea. Makeley sold the tape to hard copy for $10,000. Amy's apparent lack of remorse turned public sentiment against her, and the DA announced it would stop pursuing Joey for statutory rape. Amy was devastated by Makeley's betrayal and attempted to kill herself again. She spent the next five weeks in a psychiatric ward. 
After her release, she begged the judge to send her back to jail because the pressure of the paparazzi had become overwhelming. On November 6, 1993, Amy re-entered the secure unit that housed inmates under 21 years old. At her sentencing on December 2nd, Amy apologized to Mary Jo, but placed blame on Joey Buttafuoco. When Mary Jo spoke, she made reference to the Paul Makeley video and called Amy, quote, a pathetic creature who thoroughly disgusts me. The judge was also not empathetic. Quote, your acts were not spontaneous or impulsive. For many months, you stalked Mary Jo Buttafuoco like a wild animal stalks its prey. He sentenced her to the maximum of 5 to 15 years. Amy was immediately taken into custody and sent to the Albion Correctional Facility near Buffalo. Three months later, after mounting public pressure, the Nassau County DA reopened the investigation into Joey's sexual affair with an underage Amy. Two former employees at the Complete Auto Body Repair Shop had gone on Geraldo Rivera's TV show and reported that Joey bragged about having sex with 16-year-old Amy. Only then did police investigators look for and find receipts showing Joey had paid for rooms at three different motels and identified motel clerks who helped Joey check in. The dates on the receipts match the exact dates Amy Fisher had given to law enforcement. On April 14th, Joey was charged in a 19-count indictment, six counts of statutory rape, 12 counts of sodomy, and one count of endangering a child. The rape and sodomy charges were felonies, and the acts were all committed between July 2nd and July 10th, 1991, when Fisher was 16. At that time, Mary Jo still insisted that, quote, Joey never cheated on me. We have a good, solid relationship. He never had an affair with Amy Fisher. In November 1993, Joey began serving just four months of a six-month jail sentence. After he was released, he returned to the home he shared with Mary Jo. In 1996, the Buttafuoco's moved to Los Angeles, where Joey participated in several reality TV shows. After years of physical therapy and multiple reconstructive surgeries, Mary Jo had become addicted to painkillers. In 1998, she entered the Betty Ford Clinic. During Mary Jo's recovery, she decided to forgive Amy Fisher. She had now met with her mother, who was divorced from Elliot, and she learned about the abuse Amy suffered from her father and her rape at age 12. Mary Jo was so moved, she even wrote a letter to the DA and said that she thought Amy had done her penance. Amy petitioned the court in 1998 for a new trial, claiming ineffective counsel during her 1992 sentencing. Amy said she was advised she would receive parole and work release in three years if she pleaded guilty to first-degree assault. In April 1999, her original sentence was vacated. She was then resentenced to a shorter prison term, making her eligible for parole. The New York Parole Board granted her release after she sent an apology letter to Mary Jo Buttafuoco. In the letter, Amy said that shooting Mary Jo had nothing to do with her or Joey but had to do with circumstances in her, Amy's, life that were transferred to Mary, that she was full of rage, insecurity, and anger. 
Amy did not say who she was mad at, but I don't think it was Mary. After she apologized and Mary Jo Buttafuoco publicly forgave her, Amy Fisher walked out of prison on May 6, 1999, after serving seven years. After her release, Amy wrote a column in a local New Jersey newspaper. She met her husband, a former police officer, on a dating app, and they married in 2003. The couple had three children. The same year that Amy married her husband, Mary Jo finally divorced Joey. Years later, she would write about the shooting and her marriage to Joey in her book, Getting It Through My Thick Skull. What did she finally get? She finally realized that in spite of his big personality and charm, life with Joey was a life of chaos. Lying to her about his sexual